Hey guys, in this video we're going to be doing a teardown and hopefully a repair of some Dyson Airblade hand dryers. Uh, for those of you who don't know, those are a type of hand dryer that uh, creates a jet of air that sort of wipes water off your hands. Uh, these are normally very expensive. I'm getting these for work. These are normally about $1,500 each. Uh, and these ones are much cheaper on eBay. They're about $120, $130 because they were either unknown condition or in need of repair. And I figure it should be relatively easy to, to repair these. I got a 120 volt one. This was uh, sold as as is, not working. And there's two 208 volt ones, which were also cheap and sold as unknown, but removed from a supposedly working installation. And I think the 208 ones are cheaper because that voltage is less common in in conventional bathrooms if you're adding one of these yourself. So the 120 volt ones have a big premium. But uh, let's uh, tear into these and see what they're like inside. And this is why you bag things before peanut packing them, because the packing peanuts are just everywhere now. Okay, let's see how we get this thing open. Okay. That, okay, that comes off. And then what's on the top? So it looks like this just needs to pull forward. I got one of the snaps out. There we go. Easy. Some random mounting hardware. Oh, more of this stuff everywhere. But as expected, it's kind of simple. It's very simple inside. Looks like the air goes through an air filter, through the uh, the Dyson digital motor, and then through uh, into the nozzles. So let's just start by checking all the connections, and then we'll connect power and see what it does. It looks like the previous uh, user had attempted a repair because I'm pretty sure duct tape is not a factory thing from Dyson. So someone's been playing around with the, the sensors that detect your hands are present. But anyway, let's try it. Let's connect power and see what this does. Nothing as expected. Uh, let's see if we can see the IR sensors emitting anything and nothing that I can see. This one looks a little bit uh, cracked, unless that's some sort of special... No, I think that's a special lens. The... It's an odd pattern, but it's like, consistent. It's consistent across both sides. And in there, anything? No. So I would say the sensors may not be working. If you could hold the camera. I'll just stick my hands in there. No, I think something is wrong with the sensors. But let's, um, I think at this point, uh, let's do a teardown and then we'll get to the repair afterwards. And let's just start tearing this thing to bits. Air filter. That looks absolutely immaculate. At least either it was just replaced or this thing doesn't have many hours on it. And then it looks like we'll need to undo some bolts to get this motor assembly out. And other than that, it looks it's actually really easy to disassemble. Oh, and the screws are all all torques. I really like that. So far I'm really liking the construction of this. It's all very modular and disassembles easily. This uh, this seems to be uh, the thing that runs the IR sensors and tells the motor to turn on and off and it just pulls out and this, the wires come out, the board comes out, and this, you can disconnect sensors, and it all pulls apart really easily. That was pretty easy to get out. Now let's see if we can actually see what's in this motor. So far it's been very easy to disassemble, and still being that way. Um, how does this open up? It looks like it's all one piece. No, oh, I see how it goes. Okay. And then in the oh, ha, huh. that's nice. Wiring compartment just is a connector. I'm liking this thing more and more. Else am I? Oh, there's more screws up here. I think, I think we have to take off these screws or this 
uh, duct thing first. What? There's one Phillips. Everything else is Torx. I'm almost certain this one Phillips screw was from whoever tried to repair this because I can't see Dyson doing all this nice design and then putting one screw as different from all the others. Whereas all the others are the same driver. Okay, you can see a little tiny bit of the motor, not too much. But I think this is what's going to be needed to get it apart. There we go. Okay, just had to come straight out evenly. And there is the, um, what they call the Dyson Digital Motor, which is just a, looks to be a, a well, they claim it's a, they say it's a switched reluctance motor. I am not too familiar with that type. Is this the part that rotates? It looks like it is. And it has, wow, has immense cogging. That is not a switched reluctance motor. I think that's a permanent magnet motor because switched reluctance does not have cogging. This has extremely powerful cogging. Actually, I think I know how this goes. You need to, I think you got to jam the rubber inside, inside the hole. Let's see if that does it. There we go. And you also have to squish the frame like that to elongate it to get it out. Oh, but there we go. That is now out and it's still not very visible. So a lot of layers in this, but very modular construction. I'm really impressed with the ease of serviceability, even though these don't seem to be serviced that often. Well, actually, actually I'm really not sure about that. There could be a big uh, service industry for these, and I don't really know about it, I suppose. I know there's some, a few eBay sellers who sell spare parts, so spare parts are available on the open markets. I'm not sure if Dyson sells them, uh, sells them or not. Okay. This motor is actually really small. Okay, so at this point, this is just held in there with, um, or with springs, yeah, for, for vibration isolation. And this rubber thing is, is again for, so it can move a little bit, so the vibration isolation can work. So at this point we can get to the uh, motor, the inverter that drives the motor, which if anything that's probably the issue, but as far as I know, no one on YouTube has actually torn this down and so we can see the, the compressor, and I want to do that, so I'm just going to start tearing this down. It's very nice vibration isolation on this. Uh, it, makes it, it makes it easier so you don't have to 
perfectly balance all the very high speed rotating parts. Although I'm pretty sure that I'm sh I'm sure they put a pretty good effort into balancing them as much as they can. But if you could avoid doing any sort of active balancing, that would save a lot of cost if you could just add a few springs like this. Ha! <laughs> Getting smaller and smaller as we go. And what's next? Looks like there's two clamshell halves here that are clear. Also, oh, there's a screw. Mm. So far there are only three types of screws and most of them are all one type. Okay, so. I'm seeing glue, but I'm not too, too afraid. Yeah, this is, yeah, a lot of this is, seems to be glued together annoyingly. But I at the very least want to see want to see the compressor if we can. Oh, there's a snap feature on this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's some snap features on this. But I am not sure how to separate them because it is all glued. <laughs> so after looking at this more, it, uh, we have reached the limit of my of what impresses me about the design. This does not impress me because this is all, everything on this is glued. Like it's screwed together with a couple screws, but all of these parts are very solidly glued together. And there's no easy way to take this apart without, I feel, destroying it. So at this point, I'm not going to take this apart. I'm going to see if we can get this working. And I apologize for not being able to do the teardown. Although if this uh, hand dryer is not fixable, I'm, I'll destroy this and tear it tear down because I really want to see the compressor compressor in this because I, no one has really shown that but so let's uh, I'm gonna try we'll try to do the um, fix on this and then we'll see how that goes but basically this is it's really small it's a little bit bigger than a pop can the um, the airflow goes in this portion sucked across the motor just like any normal vacuum cleaner has air blowing over the motor to, to cool it uh, the compressor portion is somewhere in here uh, you could, we get a tiniest, tiniest glimpse of it looking in, but you can't actually see anything interesting, so I'm not going to bother trying to look in there. But the out this portion, everything about here, here up, is all some sort of a muffler. There is, there's these chambers in here, and then the output has this like, sound absorbing material. So they're very, very concerned about noise in this. But, yeah, I'm not going to try to turn, turn it down right now. I'm going to try, we're going to try, I'm going to try to power it up. So, the, so it looks like it's just mains power connected straight to the motor. And the motor supplies, um, has this connection that goes off. It has three wires. And it looks like, from this board, it connects to this connector. And there's two that are clearly power, because they go through a common mode choke on their way to the power supply. And a third has an optocoupler here that pulls a signal to ground. So... I'm going to connect power to the motor and jumper that signal to ground and I think that will turn the motor on. If it does, then that means that this board is just bad. And worst case, I'll just put like a switch, like a foot switch or something to control the hand dryer. Okay, initially connecting power. Go. As expected, nothing. And I'll uh, give you the camera. And... So shorting these two wires should turn the power on. Now if you're doing this yourself, be careful. These are almost certainly uh, not, they don't have mains voltage between them, but they ha are connected to mains. So they may, you have to be careful with these. So I will carefully connect these together. No, nothing. So this could be a dead motor. I'm going to see if there's any voltage on these. 
That is very low. I was expecting more voltage than that. Yeah, it's pulsing, it looks like. Or is that zero? Yeah, I think, I think something is wrong with the power supply in the motor, because that should be a constant voltage, I believe. So I checked the, uh, this uh, signal connector coming out. There's no power coming out between the red and black wires, which go to the, the power supply on this board. So at this point, I'm going to have to at least open the back of this to see what's going on. So let's do that. Yeah, it seems like inside this there is some sort of a power supply, like whatever the logic or control power supply is dead. So it looks like... I'm not sure how much they've glued into this top thing. I'm just going to see if I can carefully pry it off without damaging the, the PCB. It's going to be difficult. Oh, I see a bunch of... Uh, there is a bunch of skid marks on the top there. Something blew up. <clears throat> Ooh. Yep, so what do we have here? Something has blown up or has arced or something. Ah, oh, there we go. I see a I see a blown trace there. So yeah, I'm gonna have to pull this board out and see if we can figure out what's wrong, but I'm hoping it's just a shorted uh, semiconductor or something like that so that can be repaired. Yes, so there's very clearly a blood broken trace and that is straight off of the mains input. So something has gone very badly short, has got shorted very badly. My suspicion is going to be, it looks like there is, so there's a, a bridge rectifier here, you can see the, the back of it, back of it in here, this is normal, uh, we call GBJ series bridge, and then there's, looks like there's four power transistors, two here and two here, that switch the uh, switch the motor windings, and the motor connections are these and these. So I'm just going to get a, grab a multimeter and start seeing if I can figure out what has gone shorted here. Dead short on the inputs to the bridge. Uh, actually, that's probably going to also mean the DC bus is shorted. And let's try the transistors as well. So that's going to be... I don't know what these are, but... Okay, open. That's generally a good sign. Unless it's been completely blown out. These usually fail short, and if there's enough energy, the uh, fault will blow the transistor up completely. That did something. 1.7 volts. That's within the realm of possible. There we go. Okay, 0.7. That's about right for diode drop, so that transistor is probably fine. That one also. Yeah, if it's not a dead short, not fully open, the transistor is usually fine. Or it hasn't suffered a massive catastrophic failure. That's a different forward voltage on that one. That one's a bit weird. The voltages are different, but I think these may be... P uh, I'm not sure what the, how this is wired, so uh, this might be normal. Actually, I think the way they've wired this, this is probably normal for... because there's two... Um, I'll sketch out the circuit uh, in a minute so we can see how it's connected up. But definitely the diode bridge is... Uh, is dead short. But if it's just the bridge, that would be a good because that's easy to replace. I think I even have that, have some of those in stock here. 
there's clearly a lot of automation going on when they made this because this I guess this silicone they put on top of uh, these this solder, these solder joints that was clearly done by a robot like a person wouldn't apply it in that perfect square pattern although this one is a lot more a lot more random so the serviceability on this definitely ends with this motor this is just an absolute nightmare to take apart it looks like what they've done is assembled this PCB with all sorts of components like this capacitors, re bridge rectifiers, heat sinks on transistors, some wires to a coil. Uh, then they've gl put glue on this frame inside and then placed the board in and all those components got glued in. So the only way to take this board out is to desolder all four power transistors, the uh, connections to the motor, the connections to the capacitor and the connections to the bridge and this hull sensor which goes down to detect the the rotor position and that goes down that goes down in there and then is glued so there's it is an absolute nightmare to service these these were these were clearly intended to be a if it broke you throw it away item so i'm going to use this uh desoldering tool a vacuum desoldering tool which is actually pretty effective on stuff like this I find moving it around in a circle like this helps a lot. And this generally clears it up enough that you can pull things out. I usually let it sit for a while to, to connect in, then turn it on and turn it in a circle. And then turn the gun upside down so that the solder all goes through. And I'm just going to repeat this for all of the solder joints. We finally, finally have this board out. It took, I don't know, 45 minutes or an hour of desoldering hell to get this thing out. But now you can actually see, uh, see the construction. Um, all of these parts, as I said before, are sort of mounted to this board. Put, have, glue is put in and the board is stuck down. And it's basically impossible to service. But it's become a lot more clear now what actually happened. Um, Based on how clean the filter was we saw outside, it was completely unused. It was completely, uh, completely immaculate. So what I think happened here, based on these MOVs that have exploded, these are basically surge suppressors. Uh, these are rated, they're uh, 140 volt rated. It says 140 on them. And so what I'm thinking happened here is the person who bought this air blade mistakenly connected it to, this is a 120 volt air blade, they mistakenly connected it to a 208 or 240 volt supply and it just instantly blew up the blew up the motor and it would do nothing and that's why it was sold used on eBay. But it looks like what happened is the, as soon as they connected power the MOVs immediately exploded that created a small arc flash and that caused an arc flash between the mains input and the output of the bridge rectifier which then blew up this little trace, you can see, it's a little bit hard to see, I'll see if I can get a better view of that, but uh, you can see right there is a trace that is just fused and blown open. Uh, I've checked all of the tr power transistors, they all check out good, so I'm hoping that this has actually survived the overvoltage, and the only thing that seems to have blown is a couple of the diodes inside the bridge rectifier. So I'm going to put a new one in, I've got one I've uh, got one done this setup. Uh, I'm just going to take this thing out. This was what used from the old uh, treadmill accelerator video. Uh, but I'm going to take this out, put this in, and see if we can get this thing working. While I have this open, I'm going to give a much more detailed uh, overview of sort of what's inside it, at least to the extent I can without destroying it. So I I'd initially assumed, based on some literature I'd read somewhere, that these were switched reluctance motors. But at least for this model, that's not the case. This is a... Uh, a permanent magnet motor. There's a viciously powerful neodymium magnet inside this. This is the actual rotor. It's really hard to spin. You can see it spins. It's um, it's four pole. And the construction's interesting. It appears to be a cylindrical magnet with a hole through the center. Sorry about that. And then it's wrapped in carbon fiber so that it, when it's spinning it's, uh, it's a really high speed, something like 80,000 or 100,000 RPM. The magnet doesn't explode from the centripetal force and it's got uh, four, yeah, four coils around. It turns out these are all connected in parallel. I'll show you, a, I've traced out the basic schematic of this control board. I'll give you, show you that in a sec. But yeah, these coils are all connected in parallel and they're just driven by a simple, a simple H-bridge. 
Uh, other than that, you can, it's really hard, I can't really get you a good view of the actual compressor. Uh, I've got a, I should have a pic here on screen showing you sort of what the compressor looks like. I kind of wish I could open this up and show you the real one, but I'd have to pretty much completely destroy it. But other than that, there's just uh, there's some heat sinks, there's a few filter caps. There's also uh, these two wires. These go down, if you look around, uh, if I can get light in there. Let me see if I can get you a better shot of this. You can see a coil. Yeah, there we go. You can see a coil down there just up, up from where the blue capacitor is. And I'll show you... Um, I'll bring out the schematic here. This is what I have uh, managed to trace out so far. Uh, yeah, mains comes in. This is the coil the coil um, here that goes down. Yeah, I, I don't think it's power factor correction, I think it's more just a noise filter because I don't think you can get a large enough inductor in that size to do real PFC. This is the diode bridge here that blew up. Uh, the MOVs that blew up are uh, here across the mains and here on the output of the bridge. There's, these are the two capacitors, these are the two capacitors you see here, which strangely are different values. They're 6.8 and 8.2 microfarads. I don't know why in the world they wouldn't just make them the same, because there's room, it looks like there's room for both. Room to have the, both of them be the same size. And then there's uh, there's no bulk electrolytic filter capacitor here, so this is like a, this is a high ripple output, and the motor basically operates in sort of pulsed mode. It, it like, it has, um, it operates pulsed at 120 hertz from the rectified from the rectified output, but for an application like this, it doesn't really matter. And they probably vary the power of the motor with the with the sine wave to do some sort of power factor correction or have it draw a better, a more sine wave like sh uh, shaped current. And then the inverter stage is just four power transistors. They're G6B 330. I think that means 300 volts, 30 amps. Um, and then the motor, all the motor coils are wired in parallel, uh, in parallel on the PCB. So they're just wires that that one connects to that, that, that connects to that. And then the rest of the circuitry, I haven't bothered to trace out. This is just going to be a microcontroller of some sort, a bunch of stuff, um, passives and things around it. So there's a hall sensor here. It turns out, I mentioned earlier this was glued in, but it turns out the glue, either the glue didn't adhere properly and just came out or they intended that. And on the other side, more supervisory stuff, power supplies. I'm not exactly sure how they're deriving the low voltage supply from mains power. I was figuring it might have been a capacitive dropper, but I don't see anything on here big enough to do that. So could be that inductor. But there's definitely no isolated power converter on this. And then uh, on this side, these two, I'm pretty sure, are the FET drivers that drive, uh, half bridge drivers to drive each of these two two half bridges. My plan of attack for repairing this is going to be to take out everything I can, all the components I can from this part, solder them back on here, and then uh, I'm going to replace the bridge rectifier with a new one, for a new one from, from this. With all the components removed, or uh, not, not glued in anymore, it's going to be much easier to just take the PCB assembly and insert it back in. At this point, I believe the only thing I'm going to have to disconnect to remove this now is going to be the two wires to the inductor and the four connections to the motor. So I think it'll be a lot easier to service once I've got the glue glue removed. I have cleaned up this board now as uh, best I can. The The conformal coating they have on it is just ugly and it I, I can't really make it look any better than this, but I think this is going to be fine electrically. Everything is soldered back in. This is pretty much what it looked like when they uh, before, when the guys at Dyson actually assembled it. And it should just slip in here if I can get this aligned correctly yeah, I'm going to pass the camera off okay oh yeah that is so easy to assemble if only it was that easy to disassemble okay board goes, that's almost sitting too low. I'll put it at sort of nominal height and then uh, we still, I still have to take this apart later to put the MOVs in because I have to order those in but just for initial testing I think this is going to be fine and it's going to be much easier to take out now because not everything is, uh, is glued in place. It's all good. Thanks.
Let's see. Not the best joint, but good enough for testing. Thinking about how this goes together, if all they did was stuff some foam down in there so those components didn't rattle around, it would have make it, made it so much easier, because then all you would have to do to take this apart is just take, take those four off, those two, and it would pop out. It would be so much more serviceable, but no, they decided to glue everything. This is test of the repaired motor. Three, two, one. Okay. And going to turn it on. Here we go. Three, two, one. Yes, yes, it works. Yes, that's exciting. It actually works. I can't believe that. It, the, whole, the inverter survived all this and we were able to get it working. Nice. So at this point, I need to order new MOVs and get those installed, then we can put it back together. I was curious what speed this actually runs at, and according to the camera, it's 12 frames to do a full rotation at 16,700 frames per second, which comes out to, uh, I believe, 83,500 RPM, which sounds about right based on what Dyson was advertising. Now that we've established the motor works, we've got to replace these blown MOVs. I went and, uh, dug through the bin of old PCBs and I found these. Old, these are inverters from washing machines, and these happen to have the exact MOVs required, so I'll just swap those over. <laughs> Okay, yes, that was so much easier. All, all they had to do, all they had to do was not glue those in, and this would be so much more serviceable. Shame on you, Dyson. Those are now those are now installed. That is should be fully repaired. So I'll put it back together. And I want to also do a few do some measurements on this motor. I want to see see if we can see at least the current waveform through this inductor. I want to see the current waveform on the AC mains input. And if it's possible, I want to try to see the current through the the motor coils. So I'm curious sort of how they're how they're driving these. All back together now. Let's give this a try. Power's on. Three, two, one. Perfect. So, uh, I'm going to hook up the scope to current probe to the mains input. We'll see, see what this thing draws. I'm kind of curious. I also want to look, uh, using the high-speed camera, and see how the motor starts. I, I'm figuring it may have to wiggle the rotor back and forth until it gets past the cogging and then can accelerate, but Oh, yeah, I want to see what it actually does. That's actually a reasonably good sine wave. Uh, the power factor will be pretty good on that, like probably almost like 0.95 or something. And the harmonics content isn't too bad either. You can definitely see, if we zoom in, the ripple, that's the ripple from the actual switching frequency. Let's see what uh, what frequency is that actually at. So that's at about 6 kilohertz. So that, that's what that inductor that we saw sort of around the outside of the motor was for, is to filter that out, because without that inductor there, this much more of this sort of audio frequency would be getting out onto the mains. And I think what was happening is this frequency could cause audio interference and things. Because below, below 150 kilohertz, you're allowed to put out as much interference onto the mains as you want, but obviously if you put too much out, you'll start causing problems, so I think that's what that inductor is for. But yeah, that, that's, that's actually, that's not, I was expecting a little bit worse waveform like that. I was expecting it to draw more, more current around the peaks and less around the troughs. I'm going to have a go at measuring the static pressure of this, so I'm just going to have a go and see how, if I can hold this on. And then I'll put this uh, 
thing over to the manometer gauge and, and try to block up the airflow to correct about. Ready? So the peak I saw it got to was up about here. Uh, that's about it's about five feet of water, so about two and a half psi, which is actually reasonably impressive. That's that's a lot of pressure. The last thing I want to look at before reassembling this is how the motor starts up. So I've got a Kronos high speed camera set up. Uh, this is recording now at uh, 5,900 frames per second. So let's see how this goes. Okay, so it just looks like it just started right off. Yeah, it went immediately in the direction it needed to go and just kept going. I want to try this, I'm going to try this a bunch of times and see if it always starts off directly like this. This might just have been random chance. Just tried that 10 times and it started perfectly every time. So they've done some things with this motor to ensure that it always starts in the correct direction every time. It never has to like, like wiggle it back and forth, which is a little bit surprising, but uh, it might be something to do with how they designed the uh, the pole pieces, or how the magnet in the mag in, in the center is uh, the, the particular way it's magnetized. It may be sort of offset it a little bit, so it can always start reliably. Okay, first test where I've just disconnected the, the connections to the nozzles because if there's any dust in here, I don't want it to get pushed up into the nozzle and clog it up. That's actually why there is an air filter here is because you don't want dust getting through this because it would clog up the very fine, it's less than a millimeter gap on the nozzle, something like half a millimeter or so. Anyway, let's plug it in. So apparently you need both hands for this one, whereas the old air blades, the, the old ones we have, you need only one hand works. Okay, but dust is out, now we can reconnect the nozzles. It turns out that the sensor here that wasn't working turns out the, the actual receiver parts just had fallen out. And it's good that they built in a safety system so that if, if one of these falls out, it doesn't just run the dryer all the time, it actually detects the, the fault and falls back on the, the one sensor that was working. Let's see how the 208 ones are. This box feels almost suspiciously heavy. I don't didn't expect them to be as heavy as they uh, as it's like to see. We okay, have two air blades. And they seem to have been packed reasonably well and have generally survived. So these older ones, these are the older generation. These are the one uh, we were looking at earlier was an Airblade DB, which is sort of the newer version. This is the um, 
an old, this is the old one. Oh wow, the, the casing is die cast. That's why it's so heavy. It's built way better. Okay. So we've opened up both of them. This one seems to be, has been opened at some point. This box thing is loose. Uh, this seems to be some sort of unused thing for the, as a drip catcher, because this, this drip hole thing is plugged. Um, the other one seems to be in a bit better condition. It's all fully assembled, so we're gonna try this out. This is set to 208 volts, so let's go plug this in. Yeah. Going in. Okay, let's see if this works. I would call that a success! Just powers up out of the box, nice! The only downside, yeah, this is 208 volts, so we gotta figure out how to get that in the bathroom, but... I'm just curious here what happens if we turn the voltage up or down when it's running, so we'll do that and see if the speed changes. Okay, let's turn it on. So yes, the speed does change with voltage. So the motor does not have closed loop feedback, it seems to just go as fast as it can. Unit number two. As advertised, they did work. Nice. Now that the AB14 is fully operational, I figured I'd go through the differences between the first generation air blade, uh, this is an AB02, and the AB14. Uh, the biggest difference is the older ones have a fully die cast case. This is everything here is die cast aluminum. It is extremely robust. And the new ones are just feel so much flimsier and cheaper. Although the, the functionality of the new one, I would say, is better. It's quieter, it, the motor spins up faster, it dries your hands, I would say equally as well. I think the, the this one has 1.6 kilowatts power, this is 1.4, 1.5, but the newer, more efficient motor seems to make up for that. But yeah, the, the, just the construction quality is so much better on the older ones, and it's a, it's a pity they have gone from this beautiful die-cast aluminum to this cheap plastic. And these, the, the pricing, I don't believe is much different between these two, I think. I believe the pricing on this was something around $1,500, $1,600, and this is around uh, $1,400 today. So this is like modern, the quality of a modern consumer vacuum cleaner, and you're paying so much more than, than the quality you get here. And yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to pay $500, $600, Seven hundred dollars for this, but no, I think fourteen hundred is too much for what is basically the quality again of a modern vacuum cleaner. The case fronts are equally robust. This, this is just beautifully made. It's a huge, heavy die cast piece. They've changed the duct design quite a bit between the two. In my opinion, this one is kind of over engineered, over complex, over. Um, it's more harder to service than it needs to be because. This duct piece is actually one piece that goes all the way down, all the way around. So to get this out, to, for example, to get the nozzles out to clean this, as far as I know, you have to take the entire front off of this and get this off, then you can remove the nozzles. Where this one is much more reasonable. The nozzle is much smaller. The hoses are, the hoses instead of these giant molded plastic pieces. And this is, this is just much more reasonable. This is, this is what was needed. I just noticed that this duct is even more complicated than I thought. If you look in there, you can see there's uh, it's sort of two layers. There's a grill on the inside with a foam with a foam material. And I think that's for sound insulation, because I had mentioned or I'd heard that uh, on the new on the on the new Airblade, there's a uh, they really carefully designed it to reduce sound. So I'm thinking this ended up really loud, and they had to do this sort of complex duct design in order to to get the sound low enough. And then they solved that with a much better solution, those um, uh, sound absorbing uh, resonant cavities on the, on the new one. Another reason I said mentioned this was sort of like a glorified vacuum cleaner is this piece. This clearly doesn't look like something that was designed specifically for this application because there's unused, there's unused mounting features, there's unused holes here, unused clamp or a hook. 
and then there's this lip around the edge that doesn't do anything. My feeling is this is part that came off of one of their vacuum cleaner models. This looks like the this would fit nicely at the bottom portion of an upright vacuum. And I think they just sort of added these parts on to build it into the air blade. This is the this is the Dyson Digital Motor version four. Uh, this was also used in a bunch of their vacuum cleaner models, so I think it's just the same parts. Whereas in the older AB02, this is clearly designed just for this. This was all designed to fit straight into this uh, this size of case, and I don't think this was used in any any of their uh, vacuum cleaners. Earlier I'd mentioned that someone had been in here and was probably put this duct tape on, but I'm not sure of that because now I see duct tape on this uh, this one as well. So I'm thinking this probably was factory. That's not something I would have expected to see out of Dyson. I would have expected to see something a little bit better than duct tape. In terms of date range, the uh, AB01 was released in 2006. I'm assuming the AB02 was released in the same year because this is just the 208 version where the AB01 is the 120 volt version. And the AB14 was released 10 years later in 2016. We'll have a quick look inside this box thing. Uh, curiously, this box up here has a connection has a connection for a drain plug, but that drain plug doesn't actually have any ha go anywhere. I'll show you that after I pull this out. This is pretty much the same thing as that that circuit board we saw from uh, the, from the other air blade. But this has much more on it. Let me zoom in here. This has pretty much the same exact set of connectors that went to the other board for the IR emitters and detectors usual microcontroller stuff, but this one has a full, full-on mains power supply on it. So the power goes to, uh, goes to the motor and it also goes directly to this, and this has, I'm not sure if this is a universal input or is a, uh, it has a different version for the 120 and 240 volts, but yeah, this board has been simplified very significantly on the, on the newer versions. I do like the construction of this, it all goes together very easily, just like the other one. very nice little positions to put all the wires so everything stays stays clean. So the parts, yeah, just like the old newer one, the parts they do want you to service are easily serviceable. I'm going to open up, I'm going to open up the motor and see how different that is because I think that's going to be very very different from the one we looked at earlier and I'm hoping that the old one is was much more serviceable. My, my feeling is they probably put a bit more effort into serviceability for these, for the initial ones. Here's that connection, you can see it over on the left there, it's trying to get the exposure up, where it connects up to here. It looks like it was for a drain, however, there's actually nothing in here. There is nothing at all, so I'm figuring that was a, an option and it's just not fitted in this particular air blade. In here, it looks like this was some sort of a, something to catch, to catch drips. There's uh, some fittings for something that, I'm not sure what it would have been, a, a heater or something to evaporate water, or... Yeah, there's some sort of option, I think, that went in here to deal with water that is just not fitted. And on the modern ones, they basically just don't bother at all. It's just, it's just flat, it's just flat across here and the water just drips everywhere. And they actually sell uh, a tray that you'd mount under the unit here, so the water would just drip down and drip into this tray, and that's sort of one deficiency on these. They don't they don't handle the the wastewater very well. Here's the inside of the older Dyson Digital Motor. This one, I think, is actually the switch reluct switched reluctance motor that I was mentioning earlier. I think they've changed that on the newer ones, but I'll pull this out and see what we can see in terms of uh, seeing the fan blades. But unfortunately, this one is also glued shut, and I can't see any screws, so I don't think there's much hope of getting this thing open without destroying it either. However, the electronics are far, far more easily accessible. Uh, see if this will pop out. Get some of this uh, stuff out of the way. Oh yeah, it's just sort of held in place by the by the um, what do you call it piece of piece of rubber. There we go. Get this 
out of the way. There we go. Yeah, so that's pretty much yeah same stuff we saw in the inverter for the other for the other motor. There's four power transistors, two capacitors, bridge. There's the choke coil, which honestly looks like a last minute addition or change because there's room for a coil here, but there's nothing populated, and there's this one there that's bigger. So I'm thinking that they needed to make have a bigger a bigger coil than they initially thought during the design to get the uh, conductive interference low enough. But yeah, I like this design much more in terms of repairability because you can actually get in here and service this and make measurements on it other than all of the glue they've dumped around here. That's probably for vibration reasons, so it's a little bit understandable. But yeah, I like the, the construction in terms of serviceability on this is just far, far better than the newer digital motor. Ah, yes. Yep, that's quite a bit smaller than a normal vacuum cleaner motor. It is much easier to see the compressor on this on this motor. And, and I'm just spinning it from the back. And it's, yeah, this is definitely not a permanent magnet motor. This is the switched reluctance motor that uh, I had heard mentioned. And, yeah, unfortunately I won't be able to take this apart far enough to get a view of the compressor, but uh, this graphic on screen is pretty much uh, what's in there. Other than that, this motor, the exhaust is, uh, just comes out around, around the periphery here. And here it comes out here. And the motor is just, the motor looks sort of like a vacuum cleaner motor, like an old style brush vacuum cleaner motor. But yeah, it's obviously the, the ultra high speed switched reluctance motor that Dyson uses. This motor also has a much more complex encoder system. There's these slots here that go through photo interrupters, whereas the other one just had a, a simple hall sensor. In terms of cooling on this unit, the air obviously comes in here, goes across all the electronics, and then it's uh, channeled almost entirely across the motor for cooling, and they've built sort of heat sinks into the, the stampings for the laminations, which is nice. And then it goes around it into the front and then through the fan. I've hooked up some current probes to the two coils in this motor. Uh, let's take a look at what the current waveforms look like. And here we go! So let's take a look at that startup. Oh yeah, you can definitely see the alternate, uh, sort of the co alternate commutation of the motor. So there's one pulse, there's the next one, and then it alternates between the bottom and the top, uh, each channel each time as the motor as the motor spins up. I'm assuming as we go as we go further, oh yeah, it changes mode a little bit, and it still has pretty short pulses, and then it uh, current starts increasing, and you can start to see the see the modulation uh, following the, the rectified sine wave now. And then a few little step changes as it accelerates and then it yeah, then it basically reaches a reach steady state. And yeah, diff nice nice following of the sine wave there. We'll take a look at the actual mains current draw later. This is the actually this is of course the motor current. Uh, I'm gonna do a redo this shot and get a bit higher higher resolution. There's a bit better resolution of that. Yeah, really nice. Yes, yeah, definitely it is um, unipolar drive. There's no um, H bridges in the output. But yeah, you can see what each, the pulses are nicely alternating and it's interesting. Yeah, it's not often you get to see the uh, waveform in a motor like this. Bottom trace is now the mains current. Top trace is the same uh, same motor winding we were looking at before. Okay, that waveform looks really familiar, pretty much just like the other Airblade. In fact, I think that looks that looks somewhat cleaner. Yeah, if we compare the two, I'm pretty sure this is a pretty a, quite a bit cleaner than the other one. But yeah, same thing with uh, this current ripple coming through, and that inductor is used to, uh, to try to reduce that. There's a little yeah, little oscillations, little oscillations visible right there. It must be so exciting, some sort of. Uh, 
uh, resonant mode in one of the in the filter network or something. I hope you enjoyed this Dyson Airblade teardown video. This is not something you often get to see a teardown of, and you especially don't get to see a detailed look at these motors. Anyway, hope you like this video. Thanks for watching.